when you want me to start the live stream? Oh yeah, we'll, we'll wait a few minutes um, to when Bert comes in. Okay. Thanks. Well, they'll see on the live stream is me eating, so. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, all. Morning, Chris. All right, yeah, we'll just wait a few more minutes for uh, Bert to uh, get locked in here and we'll we'll start. Have you heard from him? I know he sent me an email earlier about the link for the presentation, but he said he got it. Yeah, I haven't heard from him separately, but give him a few minutes before we harass him. All right, there he is, Mr. Burt. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Uh, sorry, I got stymied with my SBE number. I couldn't remember it. So, <laughs> Thanks for being here, Burt. We appreciate it. Sure. Uh, two quick things. So one is we're going to conduct our, uh, our uh, business part of the meeting, probably about five, 10 minutes. And then uh, we do live stream and record this. So, sure. So, okay. Just want to make sure you know. All right. I think we're going to get going and um, we'll start our business part of the meeting. Uh, so yeah, March 8th, we're here. We made it our uh, 1130 uh, AM business meeting. And uh, we have Bert Goldman with us, which we'll get to shortly. So thanks again for being here, Bert. We appreciate it. Uh, looking forward to the topic. Definitely interesting. Yeah, I'm gonna look at like LA. So, um, okay, we had our board meeting last uh, last night, like we typically do. Let me get to my notes here. Uh, so a couple things we talked about is uh, NAB. You know, NAB is looking promising that it's going to go at the end of April. 
Uh, there will be the SBE national meeting. Uh, we actually have um, uh, Jim Ragsdale with SBE uh, with us. So Jim Oskin and Sec, if you have any uh, update for us, I'll just kind of go through this at first, but we have the NAB coming up. Um, Maria's gonna be looking into holiday party venues. You know, it's really early obviously, but the thought was that with uh, the mask mandate now being lifted, people in LA County, people are probably, you know, trying to get their reservations uh, pretty quick. So she's gonna be looking into that. We're also looking into uh, returning to in-person meetings. Um, now with the mandate lifted, uh, we still, we haven't decided when we're gonna do that. It's definitely on the docket. Uh, we may send out another survey. You know, of course, we did that a year plus ago. Things have changed, but um, we're still working on that. Uh, also, uh, Marcos, Doug, and myself filmed part of our CRO. We talked about that last time, the uh, certified radio operator exam. Uh, we're working with Jason Beaton on our board, um, who teaches at uh, LAVC and a couple other places, and uh, about, you know, doing stuff that he can't teach in the classroom talking about meter readings, tower lighting, showing an actual tower, things like that. So um, we got that filmed and uh, hopefully in a month or so, uh, Marcos is working on a rough cut of that. So really looking forward to that. I think that went uh, really well and um, yeah, it's gonna be cool. Uh, as far as stuff in market, the one thing I had was I saw that uh, March 23rd, 2022 is the NWS uh, RMT. They'll be, doing, uh, they'll be running, so that's about 10, 15 a.m. Pacific. Um, we'll be issuing an RMT as part of a commun uh, tsunami communications test for statewide partner agencies. So just a heads up, that'll be coming down. That will be in, in addition to our um, typical LASD monthly test, I believe. So that would be a, a second uh, RMT for this month from the Weather Service. To look out for that, uh, some SBE type news. Um, look at the other email. We're doc. Uh, it's time to renew SBE uh, membership by April 1st. Uh, you don't want any laps, especially if you have Member Plus, you won't be able to get to your webinars and all that. So traditional membership is $85. The uh, Member Plus level is $175. Unlimited access to webinars. Um, really great webinars. A lot of the presenters we have have done SBE webinars. So, uh, you know, if you watch one or two, it's worth it. Highly recommend that. Membership drive, SBE annual membership drive began on March 1st. And by recruiting a new SBE member, you not only help someone add power to their position, but you can help yourself too. Recruiters earn money for their, um, all, uh, rec recruiters earn money off their 2023 membership dues. So the SBE uh, fellow nominations are due by March 15th. Uh, that's coming up. And our SBE certification window uh, is coming up in June, June 3 through 13. And you're supposed to submit your application uh, no later than April 15th. Uh, Doug Irwin is our certification chair. Uh, if you have any questions, um, hopefully he'd be able to answer those for you. So. And then the uh, 2022 leadership development course, August 3 through 5th in Atlanta, uh, Dr. Frank uh, Planky, I think I probably messed that up, but I actually took this course, uh, man, three, four years ago, went to Atlanta and he took it. It was a really good course. Um, definitely give you some perspective just on, um, you know, management styles. And, and you, I think you learn more about yourself than you do, um, you know, managing others, which is obviously really important. So I think that's all I have. It's a lot. Uh, anyone else uh, have any LA news, anything radio wise, or want to go ahead now? Okay, SBE um, 36, San Diego. Do you have anything for us? And chapter nine, Eric, any uh, news for the chapter? Okay, Eric in there. Or anyone else for chapter uh, chapter nine? Okay, uh, Jim, you just you want to say a few words to the group, or uh, maybe expand on any of the SBE type stuff we uh, we talked about. Yeah, sure. Uh, Matt, thank you for, for leadership in this. And, and I'm glad to see several chapters 
uh, gathering together for a good presentation. Um, just to, to encourage you to check out the SBE website, especially the education page. Uh, as Matt mentioned, you know, the webinars, uh, we have a tremendous series. I think they caught uh, Wayne Pacina's series last year of uh, IT and broadcasting. Uh, he's got a, a great series of eight webinars coming up this summer. They'll run all the way till October. So I, I think if you've caught him before, I think you'll enjoy uh, what he's going to be teaching about over that over that series of webinars. Uh, hope to see people. I know it's a long ways away, but in Syracuse in the fall uh, for the national meeting. I know uh, probably more likely I'll get to see you in Las Vegas uh, for the uh, NAB show. So looking forward to catching some people there. Don't hesitate to come by the booth and say hi, and, and I'd love to meet you. So, all right. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate it. And do we have any info on the, the meeting, the SBE meeting, the NAB? Yes, the membership meeting will be Monday. Uh, we will have the meeting, I think it's at five, if I remember correctly, and then the uh, members reception. So everybody's welcome to come to the reception, eat some food, uh, get some drinks, and, and socialize a little bit. So uh, yeah, that'll be happening on Monday evening, and uh, we'll be having a board meeting on Sunday morning. Uh, there's an education committee is meeting, there's some certification uh, or at least we'll have a window for certification if, if anybody wants to take certain exams while they're there. Um, yeah, I, I think that is everything that comes to mind. Oh, we do have Saturday morning, I should say, the, the beginning of uh, the BEIT uh, will be happening Saturday morning. And so we'll have an hour presentation. Um, but we don't, we don't get a lot of time this year in that, in that window. So we just have an hour, which is a little disappointing, but but I know that they'll have good content uh, to share even in that in that limited amount of time. Awesome. And the member meeting on Monday, will that be live stream, Jim? Uh, we'll record it and we'll put it up on YouTube, uh, but we won't be showing it live. It's just the logistics of, especially the cost of internet connectivity at the Las Vegas Convention Center is pretty Pretty exorbitant. So, so we'll record it and and edit it, and then we'll put it on YouTube. Copy that. Well, thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. Thanks for being here, and we'll uh, we'll see you in Vegas. Yeah, great. Thanks. Uh, I think that's everything. One other thing comes to mind is our YouTube channel. Please uh, like our or I guess subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, since after we get to a certain number of people, we can actually live stream on YouTube. So uh, please do that. Please. All right. Anything else that I missed? Marcos, forget stuff. I think, we, I think that's pretty much it. Nothing I can think of. Okay, cool. Um, so, yeah, without further ado, um, thanks to Doug for uh, getting our presentation together. And we have Bert Goldman talk about geocasting. And um, Bert, take it away. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Okay. Hi there. Hello, everybody. Uh, let me get my show going here. All righty. Hopefully you're seeing the, uh, the screen there. <laughs> there. Is that okay? Got it? Uh, yep. Looks good. Okay. Very good. So, uh, I didn't realize we had multiple chapters, but, uh, this is, uh, ostensibly chapter 47. And uh, whoever else wants to join, it's wonderful. We're talking about synchronous boosters, design and construction. A little bit of uh, educational information uh, on top of uh, some examples. So uh, to those of you who uh, may not have messed around with boosters in the last few years, uh, the uh, FM booster is on the same frequency as the main. Uh, you have to maintain your primary contour like for a class B, the 54 dBU, and it has to be non-grandfathered. So all you superpowers on Mount Wilson, uh, the contour is non-grandfathered, which doesn't go nearly as far, which is a real treat to deal with. Anyway, uh, there are secondary status, can't cause interference to uh, any other stations, operate at any height, but cannot be over 20% of the maximum class power like 10 kilowatts for a class B, you can feed them in any manner, 
uh, must have positive control. So uh, over the years, we've determined these items as being critical to making boosters synchronized properly. What we're trying to do is fake out the receiver to think that it's looking at the same thing as the, uh, the main as the booster. So the first thing we have to do is synchronize the carrier and the pilot. We use GPS lock using uh, Gates Air Synchrocast, Intraplex. Uh, we use a 10 megahertz reference for that. Uh, we have to use the internal um, GPS because in some cases uh, we delay over one second. Uh, the maximum you can do with an external uh, GPS is uh, was under one second. Anyway, uh, also have to match the pilot phase. Modulation has to mat match within a quarter of a dB. Uh, we are now using digital composite, which is something that wasn't really available until just a few years ago, a couple of years ago, really. Uh, and uh, that works great because we don't have to mess with pilot phase. We're able to lock everything in and we, we know that the modulation is going to be right in there. It really makes things a lot easier. Uh, you can also use uh, AES, but obviously it would be harder to, uh, uh, to make that match properly. Uh, timing, uh, we use uh, Synchrocast um, for point-to-point uh, -point, um, IP connections. Uh, you don't have to use Synchrocast if you have uh, microwave links, but uh, in most cases, we wind up uh, having to use landlines. We have to make sure that the timing is set and stable to within three microseconds. And uh, that's difficult to achieve sometimes with some of the uh, uh, services, uh, the IP services that are out there. Uh, but um, when you can get it to work right, it works great. Uh, the antenna has to be designed so that you don't exceed that three microsecond uh, delay spread. And uh, as I'll show you, we're now doing HD single frequency network, either analog, uh, uh, boosters with digital main or all digital or however you want to mix and match it. Uh, to find out what listeners would put up with so that we could come up with concrete objective design parameters, uh, GEO did testing with NPR labs and Towson University. That's the same organization that uh, the HD radio folks use to come up with specifications for uh, HD radio. So we did a similar type of study and came up with what parameters we needed to maintain to keep the listeners tuned in. And if you look at that chart on the right there, the purple uh, level is what we call the 90% keep on score. And that is our goal for setting up the boosters. Here's an example of uh, some design. Uh, this is synchronized except for the fact that we're using an omnidirectional antenna. This is uh, theoretical work in uh, Chicago. And you can see that doing it this way, uh, that magenta is uh, below the 90% keep on score, that would be unacceptable. So if we use our dual log periodic antennas and point them 180 degrees from the main, uh, point it 180 degrees from the main, you can see that that interference zone goes to zero because we're able to keep that uh, time delta to uh, within three and maybe five microseconds. If you uh, try to use too much power in the booster, you create interference for yourself. Uh, as you can see all, all around the, uh, the booster here, we're creating interference, so that's unacceptable. If we point it too far to the north, we get interference to the north, too far to the south, interference to the south. Uh, this is only 12 seconds uh, 12 microseconds, excuse me, off of optimum, you create a bunch of interference right in the area that you're trying to cover, so that's no good. And uh, if you do it, this one is 10 microseconds uh, off uh, in the other direction, and um, you create a bunch of interference around yourself. So it's very tight parameters that have to be maintained for this, uh, and you have to know the signal strengths exactly as well. If you uh, want to do uh, more uh, area, you can't use more power as I showed you. So we have to use 
uh, more boosters. And so in this case, we're using three boosters to cover a larger area without interference. Obviously, the boosters and the main all have to be synchronized together. So uh, the company I uh, consult with is uh, Geo Broadcast Services, and uh, they specialize in doing uh, booster uh, deployment. Um, nearly 80% of FM stations, we believe, have some impaired coverage, some in areas that they care about, some that they don't. Uh, if they're rimshot type stations, the uh, uh, impaired signals can lead to uh, far lower revenue and, uh, and ratings because uh, even though Nielsen wants you to think that your uh, PPM meter can be received uh, in very low signal level and very low audio quality, uh, that's not true. <laughs> you need a pretty good pretty good quality. Uh, so uh, the uh, way we uh, measure things, we obviously need to know what our benchmark is, what the real on the ground signal strength is so that we can design these things. We start off with uh, a WorldCast MC5 to measure the market. We take that information and feed it into the ATDI ICS telecom uh, software. That's very expensive software that the cellular companies use uh, to calculate um, coverage. It, uh, it bears no resemblance to Longley Rice, let me tell you that. Uh, so we found Longley Rice is horribly uh, inaccurate. Uh, lately, we've also started using the uh, Octave Labs Nomad measurement system. Uh, we use that for implementation of HD and uh, uh, first and second adjacent quality interference. Uh, to show you how this works uh, in, in uh, reality here, this is uh, actual measurements we did for WXLO in Boston. You can see on the lower left there. Um, we uh, drove the market and fed it into the uh, uh, ICS Telecom, and uh, we the the propagation that we've come up with in conjunction with uh, the ICS Telecom folks is uh, ITU five two five five two six with a good diffraction uh, plus subpath and ground reflections. So it's a big mouthful, but it's obviously uh, very uh, it's it's a really good modeling package. And uh, as you can see there on the upper right, um, you can see the uh, uh, yellow trace and you can see underneath that the green trace. The yellow is the measured and the green is the predicted from the propagation software. And if you look down in the middle of that underneath, it's over 95% accurate. So uh, the prediction software is critical to make these things work. And 95% uh, reliability is, uh, is pretty good. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, uh, watermark, uh, Nielsen watermark issue uh, has to be dealt with. Uh, WXLO uh, is um, uh, a rim shot to Boston. It barely gets a 54 dBU over all of Boston. Uh, before we implemented max casting, you can see on the left-hand map that uh, there was virtually no PPM recovery. So even if you braved the lousy sound for WXLO, uh, you wouldn't get credit for it anyway. After we implemented the, uh, the boosters on the right there, you can see that uh, we're getting uh, close to 100% uh, PPM recovery. So. Uh, uh, this we actually measure, we drive it, we record it, uh, and run it through the Telos TVC15 to uh, determine the uh, PPM recovery. Uh, to show you uh, what kind of signal we're talking about here, again, this is WXLO. Uh, the uh, darker blue and white areas on the left map indicate uh, very low signal level, uh, lousy quality, et cetera. If you look at the right by adding three nodes, three booster nodes, we were able to add about a million people and increase the signal quality significantly. To show you the kind of mapping this thing does, the propagation analysis, 
<clears throat> the ICS telecom actually includes building information. So if you look down in there, you can see the reflections off the buildings. You can see the uh, street level signal uh, on every street. It's pretty incredible. Uh, this is the before reading in downtown and back bay for Boston. This is after. So again, that's before. You see the dark blue, which is lousy signal. And then after, which is the uh, yellows, and greens, and reds. Uh, we've also uh, recently put in uh, for uh, the San Diego folks, KWFN. Uh, this is our first all HD implementation. And as you can see, and those of you who are in San Diego are probably well aware of this, there's a uh, pretty poor coverage up in the north part of the market. Uh, even though the 54s get up there just fine, there's virtually nothing because of the mountains. Uh, we've added uh, these. This was the initial design. We're in the process of making some revisions to this, but this gives you an idea of what we're doing. <clears throat> this fills in all the areas. The white in the middle uh, is unpopulated, so we didn't bother with a booster in that area. So uh, signal uh, is drastically improved up in that area. We uh, also implemented HD. On the left, you can see that there was virtually no HD recovery up in the San Marcos, as Candido area. And then on the right, you can see that uh, HD is virtually seamless. Uh, right now, based on the design, you do get about a uh, uh, six second or so transition uh, going from one to the other. We're working with Xperi to uh, do a better job of keeping those synced so that you don't lose it at all. Uh, right now, we're implementing our biggest project ever, uh, San Francisco Max Casting Solution. Um, and uh, we have one node ready. We're implementing a microwave system next week. And uh, we hope to have the whole system operating and tuned by the 1st of April. So this gives you an idea of how the signal works. This is the signal leaving a typical San Bruno station. You can see that the signal obviously moves from the left to the right. But uh, this is what they've got. Most of the stations in San Francisco have boosters, but they have a booster on Mount Diablo, which, as you can see, is pointing back toward the main. So as we showed you early on, this creates a lot of interference where there is leakage across the hills between the, uh, the main and the, uh, uh, and the booster. So what we've done is we're implementing five booster sites, uh, all synchronized with each other. And uh, in doing it this way, you can see that everything is going in the same direction generally. And uh, the interference is, uh, there's a few places of interference you can see up there in the upper right, which is over unpopulated uh, marshland. Uh, and then down uh, below there's uh, mountains and such. So a uh, little bit of interference up along Benicia, but um, uh, it's uh, compared to what they have now, it's significantly better. Uh, one of the other things that uh, we learned when we studied the Diablo booster is that it creates significant interference on the other side of the East Bay Hills. It shoots over the East Bay Hills, and you can see in the center on the bottom there that over 800,000 people in Silicon Valley are getting interference, and that's palpable interference. I mean, you can really hear it. Uh, we have some recordings of that. Uh, it shoots over the East Bay Hills, and I guess when they put this on, they weren't particularly concerned about coverage in the Silicon Valley, uh, which obviously has changed quite a bit since then. Uh, this was put on, I believe, in 1989, which in that, in that year, they, it's a great job. They, they, they did as good as they could do. Uh, it's just the technology has marched on. <coughs> uh, of interest to a lot of the folks here is something that we just finished in LA. Uh, this is a hybrid type of thing between two Class A's 
that are short spaced with a translator, co-channel translator in between. And uh, this is a, uh, a likely server map showing the, uh, the coverage. Uh, there's obviously some significant uh, breaks in the coverage, uh, which I'll show, in, show you in a second, but uh, this is uh, HD on the class A stations, but translators can't run HD, so that's uh, analog. Uh, this is the actual signal level, so as you can see, <clears throat> there is a significant buffer area between them, but uh, there's pretty minimal interference because even though we can't keep the timing synced up, we can set the timing to um, minimize interference in the uh, overlap zones. <clears throat> and uh, this map doesn't show the interference, but it gives you an idea of what the signal strengths are. <clears throat> so the uh, <clears throat> uh, equipment and uh, partners that we have for uh, using this uh, system is uh, American Tower and a vertical bridge for towers usually. Uh, we pretty much have to use the Gates Air Synchrocast to keep the timing. We use the MPXP uh, composite uh, 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 codec uh, to transmit between nodes in the main. And uh, we typically use the uh, lower power uh, fax 300s, uh, fax 500s, that type of uh, transmitter. Most of these transmitters are pretty low power. <clears throat> you can see the, uh, the pattern of the dual log antennas that we use on the right. Uh, we can do those either in Jampro or Shively. And uh, SCMS is the, uh, the vendor that we usually use for this. Uh, and uh, they've been real good. They know how to put these together. So. <laughs> So uh, again, the nuts and bolts, the dual log periodic antenna, uh, high capacity microwave um, or, uh, or a high capacity uh, IP circuit, <clears throat> uh, three to five megabits per node, low latency. Uh, we need uh, redundancy and uh, uh, stream splicing, I should say, if we're adding an E2X stream for HD. Um, as I mentioned, we're using the MPXP. The exciters and the exciter software have to be the exact same models and um, software firmware versions uh, because even between firmware loads, the timing can change uh, and the uh, uh, modulation can be slightly different. So they have to match exactly. And uh, as I mentioned, we've got the HD now operating on several radio stations. <clears throat> um, so uh, one of the things that we're working on is something called zone casting. Uh, once we got these things working well for MaxCast, and we realized that there may be a potential for uh, doing uh, zoned broadcasting. We're, we're petitioning the FCC to change their rules that under uh, for five percent of the broadcast day it would be um, zoned into separate uh, geo-targeted areas. Ninety-five percent of the time it would be max casting boosters, but five percent it would be separate. Uh, we have been working with Xperi, and we think we have pretty good uh, ability to. Uh, make that transition. I've got some uh, audio samples I want to play for you in just a second that uh, shows you both max casting and zone casting uh, going from the main to the uh, to the boosters. Uh, this was uh, one of the this is the first test that we did uh, for zone casting using uh, the newer technology. Uh, this is in the San Francisco area. You see Pleasanton and Livermore there. Uh, for KSJO, they get virtually no coverage in that area. A couple of years ago, we put <clears throat> um, a standard booster on the air, cover Pleasanton and Livermore. And uh, we, uh, the only way to get up into that area from San Jose is uh, on I-680. And so we put a transition area, a transition zone to go from the main to the booster 
uh, in that area that says transition area. You can see what that looks like here. We actually have a low power uh, transmitter pointing back toward the main, but not uh, it, the, the signal isn't enough to cause interference because you're pointing back to the main. The other one is more of a standard uh, implementation. This shows you how the uh, best servers are set up between the, uh, the main and the, uh, the zoned area. <coughs> and this shows you the uh, interference in the transition. If you happen to be uh, driving through this area during the 5% of time when it's uh, in zoned operation, uh, if you're driving in a car, it only lasts a few seconds. You can see that the uh, that red area there is where objectionable interference would exist. So uh, if you're driving on I-680, uh, it usually would only last for a few seconds unless you're in totally bogged down traffic, in which case it could last a little longer. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an example of... Um, uh, uh, of what uh, it sounds like to go from the main to the booster for uh, max casting. This is fully synchronized <clears throat> and with HD. Uh, this is a uh, KSJO uh, operating in max casting mode. And you can see on the screen there, the uh, HD about halfway into this, you'll see the HD drop out. And then after a few seconds, it'll drop it, drop back in. And that is uh, the transition. So here we go. So as you can see, it's a pretty seamless transition. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, as you can see, it's a pretty seamless transition. Uh, it um, it works better than I thought it would, quite honestly. Uh, because everything's so synchronized, uh, you can't really tell what you're listening to if everything is set up properly. Uh, we usually add um, uh, a static display on the boosters so you can see on that previously so that we know which which booster we're listening to so uh it's it's kind of cool when it all works right uh this is the uh example of the zoned uh transition this is on i680 <coughs> and um you can hear at 28 seconds uh a traffic report going from a generic uh san francisco traffic report and then the same uh guy giving the traffic report uh, in the second half is giving a specific traffic report for the Pleasanton area. Oop, sorry, let's do it this way. Here we go. Um, I'll call 510-579-5211. Northbound 101 in San Francisco just after it says a shot is an accident there on the right shoulder. That's pretty much the slowest traffic in the Bay Area right now. Firm says a shot is trying to get to the lower deck of the Bay Bridge. Northbound 880 slow and go starts in Fremont. Dakota Road continues up towards A Street and Hayward. Looking at San Jose, southbound 101, slow and stretches from Lawrence Expressway to Oakland Road. Also, some minor slowing southbound things to about Hacienda. From there, it looks good in Livermore, slows again Greenville up the Alt Run Pass. That's traffic on Denver's. So, when he said uh, Hacienda and then slow to Livermore, that was the transition. So it's, it's pretty impressive in my opinion. So uh, that's about it. We've, uh, we've gone over everything. Any questions? That was, uh, <clears throat> it's Matt Burt. Yeah, it was really, really uh, interesting. So currently you need what, like an STA or you need some sort of authorization to do zone casting? Uh, 
Well, I, I think you could probably ask for an STA or, or experimental request or a, uh, uh, or a waiver, but uh, uh, the commission is likely going to be making a decision on that around June. Uh, we finished uh, our last round of field testing. We're preparing the uh, uh, submission to the FCC. We've had uh, several, um, uh, we, we, I'm sorry, we've had several uh, experimental authorities that we've run, uh, San Jose. We're doing one in, or we just finished one in uh, Jackson, Mississippi. And uh, so that's all getting put together and we'll be submitting it within the next month or so to the FCC and we understand that uh, they'll be making a decision in June. We feel pretty good that it's gonna be approved um, uh, under what specifics we're not sure, but we'll find out. But uh, I if I were planning to do this, I would just wait a little while and um, you know maybe uh, let us know if we can help you on that and uh, we can, you know, have things planned so that uh, if that's something you're interested in, we can, uh, you know, get rolling on it right away once it's approved. Yeah, I have one more question. You're talking about uh, the different, you know, types of transmitters and stuff. And so our, under, or at least my understanding has been that, you know, if you have a Nautel for the main, you're supposed to have a, you know, uh, the same brand for the, the booster. Yeah, And then I know there's been talk about, you know, with the Gates Interplex stuff, it only really works if it's Gates all the way. So what's, you know, with the transmitters and with the Interplex gear. So what's your experience? No, that's not true. We have uh, two or three systems running with uh, Nautel exciters and transmitters uh, and Gates Air Synchrocast. They're really two totally separate things. So, I mean, composite is composite. <laughs> What, so what about, you know, if the mains are not tell and the boosters uh, gates, does that matter? Or? Uh, no, those what those have to be the same. So okay. if you're running a not tell main, you need to have a not tell booster. Okay. And, and in fact, you need to make sure that the, uh, the the exciter version and software versions in the exciter are the same as well. That gets a little hairy when you're running HD with Nautel, but um, it's certainly doable. And uh, The first system we have doing that with HD is on the air now in Houston uh, for KSBJ. What, uh, my last question I actually have is, what automation were they using for the zone casting thing? I'm sorry, what? What, what automation software were they using? That oh, made... uh, well, this one, we kind of lashed something together with some off-brand that KSJO had. It's real easy to do. It's, it's just like splitting off for a stream. Right. Uh, but uh, 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 Wide Orbit has a product that's uh, being used in Europe right now uh, off the shelf. So it's an easy uh, software switch, and it, it handles everything from uh, order entry and and on air to billing. So uh, there is a, uh, a system that's uh, ready to go for it. And we found it pretty easy to uh, modify other software to work. Uh, again, it's, it's not that big a deal. Well, thanks, Bert. You bet. All right, any, any other questions for uh, Bert? Yeah, uh, Bert. Hi, Ro hi, Bert. Uh, oh, Ron hi, from Ron. KUIC here. Uh, <laughs> uh, question about the uh, air chain process uh, topology. Yeah. Is this a you know composite processing back at the studio, uh, and and then you go with uh, the wider bandwidth uh, up to your main and and booster site? You can <laughs> you can do it in any combination you want. Uh, we. Um, it may wind up taking an extra codec to do it from the studio. Uh, it just depends on your specific setup. Uh, we typically, if we can get 
high enough bandwidth IP, because you got to have some pretty high bandwidth if you have four or five nodes. Uh, <clears throat> you know, if you've got a remote transmitter site, you're probably not going to be able to get that much. So you should originate from the studio. Uh, but if you have enough bandwidth uh, and a good enough circuit leaving uh, your, your main transmitter site, you can originate there. And sometimes that's a little bit easier. That would actually be, uh, you know, our situation. I've got good connectivity or potential connectivity to the main site, but the, the booster yeah. site is questionable. <laughs> right. So what's available. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that, that would be how we would set it up there. We'll talk more about it. Okay, absolutely. <laughs> you know how to reach me. <laughs> yeah, kind of on the same lines, Bert, you know, with bandwidth is, can't you do some sort of like multicasting, like one to many, it wouldn't have to be like an additional unicast stream for every booster, would it? Uh, well, I mean, uh, that's a good question. You, we, you need to have a separate stream for each one because the timing for each one is slightly different. <clears throat> although, um, uh, although that's done on the receive end, we did some experiments with EMF a while back, uh, running it over their satellite and, uh, uh, and having you know the, the timing done at each receive point, you could do it that way. I don't think the MPXP right now is set up to do the multicast, but it's certainly something that could be done. All right, any other questions for Bert? All right, Bert, well, thanks uh, for being here. Do you want to uh, put maybe your contact info in the chat or? Um, uh, I'll send around uh, a little uh, one page that gives you contact info and a, just a little blurb, but I'll send that to you. And if you could distribute it, that would be great. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, Bert. Well, thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, okay, you bet. The one thing I did forget, uh, I knew I was going to forget something. The one thing I forgot to mention is the board did decide last night that we are going to have an April meeting. Even though NAB is at the uh, the end, you know our meeting will be the twelfth, and we are going to have um, it's going to be an evening Zoom meeting on the twelfth. So presenters still TBD, but um, put in your calendars April twelfth. We are having a uh, Zoom SB forty seven uh, business meeting. So anything else uh, for the chapter before we we call it? Okay, well, have a good week, everybody. Thanks again, Bert, and we'll, uh, we'll see you in April. Have a good week.